to be skeptical. Um, but there were certainly points made, and the prosecution asked questions to elicit evidence about all the planning that went into the killing. You know, Sickles really had lost his mind before he did this. Why did he put on a coat to conceal his guns when it was warm out? And why did he pack? Why did he have the presence of mind to pack multiple guns? Um, that doesn't really seem like someone who doesn't know what they're doing. Well, I'd like to take a step back on this trial and then talk about what was going on in the nation and why this was such a national sensation. Because we've referenced modern day court dramas like the O.J. Simpson case or more recently something like the Trayvon Martin case. And the reason they're such a big deal is because they are an example of a wider debate going on in society. You could talk about race relations. You could talk about gun rights and the question of gun ownership versus public safety. So what do you think is the national debate happening at this time in American society that would make this case so interesting to so many people? There's something timeless about the case, right? You've got a famous, powerful victim You've got a famous, powerful killer. You've got a gorgeous woman in the middle. That formula is going to work for you as a scandal, day in and day out, year in and year out, any society, any time in history. I think there's just something timeless about the DNA of this case. But I astutely point out, the cases we really focus on are often cases that hit the zeitgeist in some way. You know, they implicate something in society that makes things especially resonant to people. And, you know, in this case, you've got an antebellum view of the woman's role in society, almost like a possession or extension of her husband or the men in her life. Uh, and so the question is, if, it's, if a woman is in so many ways, your property and extension of you, if your honor is tied up in the conduct of your wife or your sister or your daughter, what are you entitled to do to enforce and avenge your honor if it's, if it's challenged in some way, say in the way that Barton Key challenged Sickles' honor by carrying on an affair with his wife? Is this what defenders of Sickles would say, that our nation is losing its honor? And also, who were the types of people who would be a Sickles defender? So I think that there was no real prototype for a Sickles defender. It was interesting. I've read diary accounts. I've read 7,000 articles about this case all throughout the country and in other countries. And every family was having debates about this around the dinner table. Sometimes it was the wife taking Sickles' side. Sometimes it was the husband. Sometimes it was both of them. Sometimes it was neither of them. And so I don't know that there's any prototypical Sickles supporter or key defender. And some people, of course, just had a, felt sorry for everyone who was involved in the case, sort of saw their point of view and everything that, that happened. Um, but yeah, I, I think this was something you could come down on any side of, regardless of who you were. Well, let's get to the verdict. What decision did the jury come to? Why did they come to it? And what was the national reaction to this decision? Uh, jury let them go. Uh, so Sickles is acquitted of the charge. And the jury wanted to let him go. It's a case of jury nullification. They say, jurors gave interviews to the press and they went out and actually some of them joined the festivities that were rollicking through Washington celebrating the verdict. And they talked about uh, the implications for their home and their spouses if someone like Barton Key was allowed to do what they were doing unchallenged. And so you have this reaction throughout the country, and it really has this incredible effect, which I was completely unaware of as a lawyer, um, on something called the unwritten law. So for a time in American history, really for about 100 years going into the 1950s, it was nearly impossible for you to be punished criminally for avenging your family's honor, the honor of your spouse, the honor of your daughter, your sister, a female family member. And it could take a lot of different forms. Sometimes the jury would refuse, the grand jury would refuse to indict you. Sometimes the judge would dismiss the charges. Sometimes the jury would just acquit you. Sometimes the jury would convict you and the judge would issue a very lenient sentence. But it was really, really 
difficult, almost impossible to punish someone who had committed a crime similar to the crime that Daniel Sickles committed. Hey everyone, Scott here. One more brief word from our sponsors. So the Sickles case really takes this concept of the unwritten law, puts it on everyone's radar throughout the country. And for about a hundred years, it becomes, you know, like I said, nearly impossible to convict anyone who did what Sickles did. Well, yeah, I'm really intrigued by that. And I don't know if there's an easy answer to this, but I could see people arguing both ways, whether that's good or bad. I mean, on the bad side, one would say the whole reason a society doesn't evolve into tribalism and clan warfare and family feuds is because you're in a constitutional republic based on the rule of law and people uphold that regardless of your motives because justice has to be blind. On the other side, people might say, well, there has to be some sort of social cohesion and this glue of politeness. And underneath that politeness is perhaps an implied threat of violence. Like the knight is someone who is gentlemanly and upholds a code of chivalry, but he'll unsheath his sword if you violate that code of conduct. So that's the other side of it, too. So how, what, what do you make of this unwritten code and this undercurrent that would be running through the strata of America, whether for good or for bad? I think you have summed up both positions even better than I could have. Um, those two competing thoughts, whether this is a good thing, whether this is a bad thing. So for nearly 100 years, the country fell in the latter camp, right? They thought it was a very good thing. They thought it helped protect the moral order and that it supported families and that it undergirded civil society. When in reality, you were really just allowing people to, to kill people without a trial, without a fact-finding process, without an adversarial process for proving your innocence. Um, and so, yeah, of course, you, you, you can't have a society based on anything else as much as, um, as, much as you may want to. Uh, but uh, and, and regardless of what was done to you or done to your female family member. And by the way, this worked both ways. Uh, sometimes people will ask me if women were allowed to invoke this defense. And actually, women had a higher success rate of invoking it than men. So this could be uh, a woman who got pregnant and the man refused to marry her or a woman who shoots the woman who's having an affair with her husband. Uh, women could use this defense too, although they did it more seldomly um, because we know the you know, vast majority of violent crimes, particularly homicides, are committed by men. Um, but yeah, for a long time in America, there would have been very little. Let me give you an example of how powerful this unwritten law was. So in South Carolina, a generation after Reconstruction, you're at the height of Jim Crow, and you have a black man who is caught in um, a, a black man who has caught his wife in bed with a white man, and he kills the white man. You think about the American South at this time and how little justice was available for African Americans in the South, and you, you're in the you're in the cradle of the Confederacy in South Carolina, birthplace of the Confederacy. And the governor of South Carolina pardoned the black man. And the public completely sustained him in this because the unwritten law was more powerful than segregation and Jim Crow and institutional racism in South Carolina in the generation after the Civil War. Okay, so if there's one thing that can bridge the racial divide, it's honor killing. That was time. That, yeah. you know, that, you, is that, is that if you catch a guy in bed with your wife, you can kill him. And nothing else. All right. Well, take what you can get, I guess. Yeah, I guess. Wow. All right. Well, what happens then to Daniel and Teresa? You are acquitted of murder for Daniel's side. And then for Teresa, you're a disgraced woman in 1859. Where do you go after that? Well, the only hope for Teresa was that her husband would take her back. If he had divorced her, she would have really been in a bad place. It would have been nearly impossible for anyone to marry her. She would have been in a really bad position financially. And so Sickles decides to take his wife back after a lot of reflection and some initial insistence that this would never happen. He decides to take his wife back. And interestingly, the public seems to get madder at Sickles for taking her back than for anything he did before that. And so there's this, you know, I found this diary 
where this group of women are in the gallery in the House of Representatives in the run-up to secession. Sickles is serving out his last term in Congress. And one woman says, why is that man sitting alone? And the second woman says, oh, it's because he killed Barton Key. And the third woman said, no, that was all right. The problem is that he took his wife back. And that's why no one's talking to him. Yeah, and this remains in the public imagination. I think in your book, you reference a play, Sickles, or The Washington Tragedy. They did a play based on this. When they wrote it, they were writing the script as it was happening. <laughs> so, so he is brutally murdered in Lafayette Square in February, and it's being reenacted on stage every night by May. How does the play end, though, if the trial isn't wrapped up? Uh, well, it, 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 it airs after the trial. Oh, okay. But they were writing the script as it was happening. Um, and so... Yeah, this is how crazy the country was for this story, that when you had a verdict, you had an official resolution, Sickles took his wife back, there's really nothing left to resolve, and the public still can't let it go because it's such a great story. So right after this, as we mentioned at the top of the episode, the Civil War happens, does this wipe away the memory of this scandal, or does it live on in any way beyond what you were talking about with unwritten law in the United States? Yeah, so certainly you get the unwritten law, which goes into the 1950s. When you've got the election of 1860, the secession crisis, the beginning of hostilities with Fort Sumter, that's obviously absorbed the public's attention. In fact, Sickles will be one of the first generals appointed in the Union Army. He raises a large number of men in New York City. This war really is a way of redeeming him. Interestingly enough, a lot of Sickles' detractors will focus on his conduct during the war, probably the most debated or one of the most debated decisions in American military history, where Sickles moved his men forward contrary to orders on the second day of the Battle of Gettysburg. General Longstreet, who was the attacking Confederate general, said that Sickles' decision was the thing that stopped him from breaking the Union lines. I would say that's probably not the majority opinion among historians and military historians. So, like everything else Daniel Sickles did in his life, he did what he wanted to do, he did what he thought was right, he didn't care about the consequences, and it's something that uh, is much debated over. I think it's a very Sickles thing to happen. All right, well, what are also, you think, uh, other lasting implications of this trial, and what do you think it says about the time period in which it happened, and maybe American society as a whole? I think the greatest lasting implication is that once this trial was over, these newspapers still had these empty column inches, these empty spaces, and they had to fill it with something. And so the press has to go looking for the next scandal. And to this day, the press needs to, now they have, the press has more space than ever, right? They have internet pages, they have cable news, there are more TV channels than ever before, and they have a constant need for content. And the thing that gets clicks, the thing that gets eyeballs, are these scandals, even if it's not edifying, even if it's more entertainment than news, and even if it's more focused on something salacious rather than something that's useful or productive to know about, this is the direction that the press has gone. And it starts in the Sickles case, where you have the first modern scandal. And so that's the most lasting implication. The most lasting implication of the trial is what you see, hear, and read about in the press and online every day, right? It all traces back uh, to this event. And I think one of the things it tells you that society wasn't that much different uh, than we are today. This, there are certain things that are innate to people wherever they live, whenever they live. And... This is one of them. This is the kind of trial that's always going to attract the public's interest and public attention. So that's the great grandfather of when you're standing in the grocery store and see a tabloid where a paparazzi takes a picture of the cellulite of a 42 year old actress because they're trying to fill out news space of a scandal that doesn't really exist. Or the cover of the New York Times. Right. Or the cover of the New York Times. I mean, no media outlet is exempt from this. Right. They focus on things that are going to get attention. And now it's worse than ever because you have advertising prices based on the number of clicks you get on your website. And so the headline needs to be as eye catching as possible. The story has to be as 
scandalous and salacious as possible. And so it's actually getting worse. 